Oh, poor Mr. Bofu. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, I'm oh. just commiserating with you. Well, uh, no. Uh, uh, no, you, you don't have to attempt uh, to chip chances. The only problem is that I have uh, this flu, but it's gone now. I think the adrenaline <laughs> uh, uh, kicked in. No, uh, we're indebted to the court for the, for the interaction. And um, the, the order that we seek is uh, obviously, whether it is based on the, well, the counter application is gone now, whether it's based on the acceptance of that the conviction was not a conviction for section 713, or that the sentence was not a sentence for the purposes of that section, or if the court doesn't like those, the mere fact that the remission the presidential remission of sentence obviously had the effect of reducing uh, the, the sentence, assuming it was a normal sentence, quote unquote, or what Justice Kambebe called a conventional uh, sentence. Assuming it was, it was those, the effect of the remission was, would have been to reduce it. If, you know, if, if the, the court is against us on all those three issues on the merits, we still say that the court will have a duty to examine where the IEC derives its power to, um, to, to deal with the holding of office, which is a, a province of the um, National Assembly. And if they are against us even on that, then the bias point with respect on these facts is unanswerable, because I don't think there's anyone who can ever say that a body, a so-called independent body at that, can uh, do what was done here. So on either one of those bases, we respectfully submit that the appeal be dismissed with cause. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Justice. <laughs> uh, Deputy Chief Justice, I mean, it's, it's 15 minutes past eight, and that's not a joke. Yeah. So, so, so I don't know what you want to do, whether you want me to just press ahead or you want no, to take some time. Ahead, All right, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to really be succinct. I, I think that it's, it's been oppressive to all of us. Um, so the, the first point is the purpose of the disqualification. We've dealt with the purpose of the disqualification in uh, our heads of argument, and we've referred to paragraph 168 of the Venice Commission report. Nothing to add there. The second question is whether or not contempt of court should be among the offenses or the crimes that are hit by section 47. We say yes, and pr probably even more so for contempt of court, because contempt of court, you will recall, is a crime against the administration of justice. That's really the essence of contempt of court. And if there was a case where sections 47, which is people trying to become our public representatives, if there is a case where section 47 should apply, it is contempt of court. Because it's a crime against the state, it's a crime against the administration of justice, it is a crime against the rule of law. It is a crime against the Constitution. And the primary duty of MPs is to uphold the rule of law. So their intentional defiance of court orders is inimical to that purpose. So in this debate about whether or not contempt of court should be within or outside Section 47, there is a very strong normative case that it should be within the ambit of Section 47. And we see this court in paragraph 87 of the uh, contempt ruling where it makes the point clear. It is almost crying for help when it says, if the impression were to be created that court orders are not binding or can be flouted with impunity, the future of the judiciary and the future of the rule of law would indeed be bleak. So if we rewarded people that are guilty of contempt of court would sit in parliament, Imagine what would happen to the future of the rule of law. The third point is around this double punishment theory. There is no double punishment. This is not a punishment. It is akin to 
the reasons for the striking of a lawyer or an attorney or an advocate from office. The reasons have nothing to do with expressing a moral opprobrium in relation to what they did to their clients, whether they stole money or not. The reason is to protect the public, is to protect the public, particularly where at the time of the striking off, they still display no signs of any reformative character. So the same object is achieved by Section 47. It is not a punishment against Mr. Zuma. It is simply to protect the public and the institutional integrity of parliament. Number four, there is the issue of ripeness. Let me spend a little bit of time on this. The powers of the commission have been much discussed. It is section 30 of the Electoral Act that applies. Section 30, subsection 1A says that any person, including the chief electoral officer, may object to the nomination of a candidate on the following grounds. One, the candidate is not qualified to stand in the election. Now, that phrase, not qualified, tracks back to section 47 itself, because section 47E, the last sentence, says a disqualification under this paragraph ends five years after the sentence has been completed. So it's a disqualification provision. But it is put into operation by section 27, subsection 2, subsection A, which says that if you want to contest an election, you must submit a list. That list must contain an undertaking signed by a duly authorized representative of the party, uh, 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 and it goes on and on. That undertaking is contained in page 147 of the records. So you will see at page 147 of the record. That is what that undertaking is. It's appendix two. This is what it says, uh, Justice Gamble, you raised this point, but never really went to the actual annexure. But it's, this is where it is at page 147. This is what you undertake. I declare, under eight, I declare that I have confirmed that each candidate on the list is qualified to stand for election in terms of section 47 and or section 106 of the Constitution. Section 47 applies to the National Assembly. Section 106 applies to the provincial legislature. So this is all a pre-screening process prior to anyone being nominated for the National Assembly. So plainly, it's an obligation of the Electoral Commission that it must screen candidates for qualification under Section 47 of the um, uh, Constitution. We have made further submissions in our heads of argument in which we point out that there is a fundamental conflict in what we, is being submitted on behalf of MK because they say that you qualify, you are eligible to stand for an office that you cannot hold. And they say, well, the solution is Rule 13 of the rules. When they have to explicate what Rule 13 is about, what they say is that in the first meeting of the newly elected National Assembly, the first order of business is the election of the Speaker. But the question is, who is electing the Speaker? In order for you to elect the Speaker, you must be eligible to be in the Assembly. So they are not answering the question, they are begging the question. So there is a straightforward answer and not the contortions being suggested by MK. Number five is the question of bias. Now, there are two documents. The first document is at page 272 and 273. That's the document that quotes Ms. Janet Love. And the actual quotation is at page 273. And it is, no, that, this one is mine, yeah. So this one says that, she says, that excludes anybody who has been given a sentence that was not the subject of any deferral. And in that sense, it is not ourselves, but the laws of the country that would stand as an impediment for that candidacy. So it's a neutral uh, statement that doesn't really take matters anywhere. Then what happens is that when the matter came before this court, this court, new evidence was then introduced, which is at page 493. It now appears that the fulcrum of the bias case is on the new evidence. So at page 493 and 494, 
was not before the Electoral Commission. It's new evidence introduced in this court. And it's introduced without an application for the introduction of new evidence. So it's impermissible. It's pro non scripto. It should not be taken into account at all. So the only issue that was before the Electoral Court is page 272 and 273. And as I say, it's a neutral statement that takes matters nowhere. And the Electoral Court, at least on this score, cannot be criticized. And you will disregard entirely the supposed references to page 493. We didn't respond to it. Mr. Mr. Toby, sorry to interrupt you. Didn't the applicant, in terms of an additional affidavit by Ms. Love, and I forgot to ask you about this earlier, also introduce new a new affidavit, and my question is, this is an appeal. Yes. Shouldn't it be decided on the basis of what was before the electoral court? Indeed. We agree entirely with that. You can disregard the confirmatory affidavit of Ms. Love, and you will be left with one document, which is page 272 to 273. We agree fully. Uh, I'm out of time, Justice, uh, Deputy Chief Justice. I have only one more point, so if I could ask for a minute. Thank you. It is in relation to the case of Disanaike. We listened carefully to what is being suggested. It's actually not correct. The correct finding is at paragraph 8.5 of that judgment. What it finds, what the actual committee found, it did not find that the principle of excluding candidates who have a criminal record is necessarily unfair it found that the period of exclusion in that case, which was seven years, was disproportionate. So it was decided on the principle of disproportionality. So you will see this where it says, uh, given that the, these restrictions rely on the author's conviction and sentence, which the committee has found to be arbitrary in violation of Article 9, Paragraph 1, as well as the fact that the state party has failed to adduce any justification about the reasonableness and or proportionality of these restrictions. The, com the committee concludes that the prohibition on the author's right to be elected or to vote for a period of seven years after conviction and completion of the sentence are unreasonable and thus amount to a violation of Article 25B of the Covenant. So it was on the disproportionality of the period of disqualification. Um, I have already made submissions in relation to um, what the remission means and what the appeal proviso means. There is no point in repeating those. Deputy Chief Justice, I want to thank the court for the patience, and we have no more submissions to make.